Hey, everybody, welcome. <coughs> this is Erasing the Stigma about mental illness in tech. And I feel like everybody's sitting over on that side, so I'm gonna <laughs> rotate so I can see everybody. Uh, I'm JD Flynn. I'm a Drupal developer, karaoke enthusiast, and there's gonna be karaoke tonight, so. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think we're, we're heading over to local place. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at JDDoesDev. I'm on Drupal.org as Dorficus on all the slacks as Dorf. Uh, in case you forgot where you are, this is Midcamp Chicago, so welcome. Uh, if you're going to tweet about this, use Midcamp and use uh, hashtag Osmi as well. Has anybody heard of Osmi? Awesome. So I'll talk about them a little bit. Uh, so who's this guy? I have been a Drupal and PHP developer for about six years. I've been doing HTML since the 90s. Uh, I had the GeoCities, AngelFire, all that stuff. I also did some basic programming, like in the back of 321 Contact, they used to, uh, the magazine, they used to send printed out programs that you could copy line for line, so that was how I learned to debug. I'm also a mid-camp organizer, so uh, this, this is mid-camp. Also organized the Chicago Drupal Meetup, or Drupal Chicago Meetup, and <coughs> Before I got into this, I was a paramedic, firefighter, and EMT for about 10 years. Also, I've got mental illness. It is plural. Uh, so I want to preface this, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not here to give medical advice. I am just somebody with mental illnesses who's had difficulties in the workplace because of them, and I was in denial for a very long time. So I'm basically just here to tell my story and offer up some resources. There are a couple reasons I like doing this talk, and if there is one sentence for what I want to accomplish, is to get people talking about mental illness in a positive way, or at least in an open conversation. And that's because people don't want to talk about it. It's usually a taboo subject when it's brought up. People back away from the conversation. People don't want anything to do with it. Uh, and you know, part of the goal for me is erasing that stigma, as the title of this session is called. I, I, I would like to get the conversation going. I'm going to share some resources, some statistics, some of my personal and professional experiences, both as a paramedic and as a developer. Uh, like I said, I was a paramedic for 10 years. <coughs> EMT firefighter before that, and I've seen firsthand on both sides of things what untreated mental illness can do, both as a caregiver and as a patient. Also, the burden of mental disorders is the largest as of 2008 in North America. Now, like I said, some facts, some statistics. According to the World Health Organization, mental illness represents the biggest economic burden of any health issue in the world costing $2.5 trillion in 2010, and is pro projected to cost $6 trillion by 2030, with two-thirds of these costs attributed to disability and to loss of work. Of the 450 million people worldwide who suffer from mental health conditions, uh, the majority, 60% of people, do not receive any form of care, with 90% in developing countries receiving no form of care at all. But above else, it needs to be talked about. <clears throat> uh, stigma needs to be erased and the projector needs to work. <laughs> oh, I uh, this happen again. Yeah. Yeah. There's something that needs to be plugged in. It, it's still recording. It, Just right now. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's recording, it should be good. Uh, no, a conversation needs to be started, and all of you that are here, you're taking the right steps towards starting the conversation, so thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Now, why should this be important to you? Approximately 20% of, 20 of adults in the U.S. <coughs> experience mental illness in a given year. That's according to NAMI.org. And we're going to find out later that number is much, much higher in the tech community. Why is it important to me? As I mentioned, I have mental illness. For a very, very long time, I suffered in silence. I was in denial. Uh, I was afraid that admitting I had mental illness would make it real. And I've also been the victim of the stigma. I thought mental illness would meant someone was just not right. And I didn't want to be not right. So I, I, I had the wrong view of things. It was pure ignorance. Also, uh, 
you know, I, I, I had the feeling that I was in perfect health until I went to a doctor and he told me otherwise. You have no diagnosis until somebody diagnoses you. Uh, I was worried that if I told people, they'd treat me differently because I had seen that happen to other people and I had actually been guilty of doing that to other people. And I was you know, worried about social distancing. Have you, any of you heard the term social distancing? Okay. So it, it's when people feel that an individual with mental illness just by having the label of having mental illness is dangerous and it results in fear and increased social distance and leads to anxiety and isolation in the individual with mental illness. So it's kind of a you know, self-fulfilling prophecy, dark circle, you know, downward spiral, however you want to put it. And there's something that I often need to tell myself, I'm not weak, I'm sick. It's not a character flaw, it's an illness, it's part of me. So. You're going to learn a lot about me, so I want to learn a little bit about all of you. How many of you are developers here, learn development, uh, site builders, themers, anything related to Drupal? Quite a few, okay. <clears throat> Any of you project managers, owners, project owners, account managers, similar, holding that title? Okay. Any of you in HR? Okay, good. <laughs> I, 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 I tend to give HR a hard time, but I understand they have a hard job and that they do have rules and laws that they have to follow. Uh, are any of you in upper management, uh, managers, presidents, CEOs, company owners, anything like that? I have. Okay. All right. So now that I learned about you, it's time to learn a little more about me. It's time to get uncomfortably personal. I have major depression which is marked by a depressed mood most of the day, particularly in the morning, loss of interest in normal activities and relationships, and symptoms that are present every day for at least two weeks. I also have anxiety disorder, which is a mental health disorder characterized by feelings of worry, anxiety, or fear that are strong enough to interfere with one's daily activities. I also have PTSD. It's a disorder characterized by failure to recover after experiencing or witnessing a terrifying event. And for those of you who don't know the acronym, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, you know, experiencing stuff both as a paramedic, firefighter, childhood stuff. You know, and I, I didn't want to admit that it affected me until I got therapy. And a psychologist gave me a very, very good analogy that really made me think. So if you think about a computer, we've got the RAM and we've got the hard drive. Just like your brain has short-term memory, long-term memory. So when you want something right there, right quick, you want it in the short in the in the RAM. You want it easily accessible, quick, back and forth. And that's where PTSD, the traumatic events, get stuck in your short-term memory. So little things can remind you of it, and since it's right there, really quick access. You, you can relive it very easily because it's right on the edge of being open instead of being converted to long-term memory into the hard drive where it takes a little bit more time to get into and it's you, know, you have to go through extra steps to actually remember it. Does that make sense or did it just click with me because I'm weird? Okay, <clears throat> so, so what changed? I finally accepted something was wrong. I saw other people living happy lives and not going through the same difficulties I had. And I started noticing that people didn't get as angry as easily as I did. Like before, I probably would have thrown something at the projector by now. Uh, people weren't affected by everyday things like I was. And I finally had an epiphany that maybe everyone else wasn't the issue, maybe everything else wasn't the issue, maybe it was me. And something that kind of reminded me of is if you go everywhere and everywhere you step smells like dog crap, maybe you should check your own shoes. Uh, and for a lot of people, including myself, this was the hardest part. I, I didn't want to accept something was wrong because I'm a perfect person, nothing's wrong with me. But I, I finally accepted it. So then I got treatment. I take medication. I believe in better living through chemistry. I'm a big fan of it. I see a therapist. Uh, that helps a lot, even just going and venting to a stranger it is just extremely cathartic. Just you know, to get it out there in the world. I also find outlets. Uh, I'm in a couple community bands. I play Barry Sax in one of them, and I play French horn in another, and I play alto sax in another. 
so that's probably the geekiest thing you're going to hear at a software conference, uh, <clears throat> and I'm proud to have that. I am active in the community through doing stuff like this, uh, organizing mid-camp, speaking at the meetups, uh, trying to do things locally in my town that uh, you know, teach development, whatever, to, to, to kind of get out there and talk to people. And I also start the conversation. I do things like this. I, I talk to people. I open up. You know, if people ask me questions, I'm not afraid to say, yeah, that's me. Uh, you know, people don't necessarily need to know the details of why I have what I have. I mean, like I said, I've got PTSD, but you don't need to know why. I'm not ashamed that I have it. I mean, it's part of me. I, I, I don't mind mentioning it in social situations, but I don't go into details. Uh, if under, other people are uncomfortable about it, that's their problem. You know, and I don't mind talking openly at events. So if you have questions at any time during this, go ahead, raise your hand, just shout them out. If you want to talk to me afterwards, go ahead, come up to me. I don't mind. So what was life like before I sought treatment? Difficult. I was paranoid about every little thing, and I didn't see other people dealing with things the same way. Uh, and like I said, I was guilty of the stigma before. I was afraid to see a therapist because I thought only crazy people saw therapists. And I, I admit now that I was very ignorant and I've grown from that, obviously. I would have very, very deep valleys where I couldn't function for days on end, barely get out of bed. I often felt useless. Uh, I felt that I would mess up everything I touch. I couldn't focus on anything and that resulted in just a lot of fear of losing my job because I couldn't focus because there, I was depressed because there was reduced output because I was afraid I was going to lose my job because I couldn't focus and it was just, you know, kept circling around and around and I spent a lot of time just trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Like I said, I was constantly afraid. I had crippling fear of everyday things. Social situations were paralyzing. Like I would not do this two, three years ago. There's no way I would be standing here two, three years ago. When I was in college, uh, I would drive, I went to a community college kind of later in life. Like I said, I had a different career and I changed completely. And when I went back, I would occasionally go to in-person in classes. I preferred online, but some things just easier to learn in person. There would be times where I would sit in my car in the parking lot for 15 minutes and find any excuse not to go in. Just, you know, oh, I have a spot on my jeans, yeah, I, I might as well go home, not worth it. I would cancel plans a lot. Uh, I had uh, quite a few friends, but I would never go do anything because I'd always cancel, so that left me feeling alone. And I made myself alone. Uh, I would have self-imposed isolation. I'd be in you know, crowded areas and you know, do everything I could to have people leave me alone. Uh, one example, I, I commute in by train to Chicago from Indiana, and it's a pretty busy train, rush hour. I'm sure that anybody who's ridden a train knows what rush hour trains can be like. But I get, in, get on the train pretty early in the commute, so there's not a lot of people, and I always have that, like, I hope nobody sits next to me by the time we get to the station. And on those wonderful days where nobody sits next to me, I start wondering, what's wrong with me? Why isn't anybody sitting next to me? I start smelling my breath and start you know, looking for reflective surfaces to see if I have a booger hanging out. Uh, just any reason. So that's kind of <laughs> the way my mind works still. <clears throat> I was angry. I was not a happy person. And people around me noticed that. Anything could set me off. I would get really, really mad at the smallest thing. Uh, and you know, a mix of a high-stress job, being on the ambulance, and untreated anxiety and depression were not a good combination. And like many, many people in public service, I was way too proud to admit that something was wrong. I mean, nothing could be wrong with me. I'm, I'm in the public service. I'm somebody that people should be looking up to, is the mentality that a lot of people had, but I did not. Uh, but I, I was definitely too proud to admit something was wrong. I was also extremely misunderstood. People often thought that I was angry when I was really just terrified or trying not to screw up. Uh, example of that, I have a couple of lifelong friends who, you know, I, I could see them 
once every five years, and it was like I saw them yesterday, just the conversations that we had. And one of them invited me to stand up in his wedding, which was like the ultimate honor for me, because I had known him literally since we were three years old in preschool and just continued that friendship. And I didn't want to mess things up for him, so I, I just wanted to not be the center of attention and make sure all eyes were on them, so I would sit at the front table just barely even eating my dinner, and one person came up to me and said, you look like you might kill everyone in this room because I was just paralyzed with fear. And that, by no means, I was not angry. I was just like, please don't let me screw up his day. So a lot of misunderstood and people mistake being basically crapping my pants for being angry, which I wasn't some of the time. So how has treatment affected me? Well, I'm not ashamed of who I am. Like I've said a couple times, I wanted to hide in shame because of my conditions, and I've realized it's just a part of me. I'm not too proud to admit that I need help anymore. The valleys are not as deep. I still still have bad days. Everybody has bad days. They're, they're, I'm not saying they're not around, but they're much less frequent and much more shallow, and I can recover a lot quicker. My anxiety has gone down but I do still occasionally get uh, panic attacks, but they're not nearly as bad as they used to be. Uh, since getting on medication and seeing a therapist, I've become more comfortable in social situations. <coughs> I'm still overall generally introverted, but I, I'm not afraid of doing normal things. They're, they're like I said, the, the, the school example, the lizard brain took over and said, get out of here. They're, they're, for some reason, it gave me the same response as if I was being chased by a beer, bear walking into that. Chased by a bear? <laughs> chased by a bear. No, that would have a completely different response. <laughs> uh, if, you know, if... Uh, yeah, just the same response if I were being... The fight or flight mechanism was very strong and just hyperactive. But fortunately, now I realize I'm not alone and we're not alone. Since getting diagnosed and erasing the stigma for myself and being able to see things kind of in a whole new light with a new perspective, I realized that a lot of my fear, in addition to the anxiety, was also adding on to the anxiety was that people, I was afraid of the way that people might view me or that people did view me. And I don't feel any way that more, I don't feel that way anymore because of organizations like OSMI. That stands for Open, Sor Open Sourcing Mental Illness. OSMIHelp.org is their website. Uh, it's run by uh, Ed Finkler in Lafayette, Indiana, and it's a worldwide organization. They're great, they do wonderful things. Check them out. So I've been talking a lot about my own mental illnesses, but what exactly is mental illness? The Mayo Clinic defines it as a wide range of mental health conditions or disorders that affect your mood, thinking, and behavior. Examples include depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, eating disorders, and addictive behaviors. But why tech specifically? It's always been suspected that there was a higher incidence of mental illness in the tech community, but there wasn't really research until Osmi came along and decided to do the research. Uh, there were sites like Deaf Pressed, <coughs> excuse me, which is now part of the OSMI forums, it's been absorbed into that. And word of mouth were all that we had to go on. And some studies shown that there's been an increased incidence of mental illness, specifically anxiety, depression, and people with above average IQs. I mean, we're developers, we, we work in tech. You, you gotta be a certain type of person to do that. The studies suggest that intelligent people with hyper brains are more reactive to environmental stimulus and that may predispose them to certain psychological disorders as well as physiological conditions involving elevated sensory and altered immune and inflammatory responses. There's also imposter syndrome. Who's heard of that? Yeah. It, it's that feeling that you don't deserve to be doing what you're doing. And I suffer from it like all the time. I don't know why you guys are here. You people are here listening to me talk. <laughs> I, I, I keep submitting talks and People keep saying, yeah, we'll let this guy do this. I don't know why, I don't understand it, but thank you. I do appreciate that. Um, I, so I, I 
I have a an inability to take compliments as part of that because I don't deserve compliments. I don't deserve to have the job I have. I don't deserve you know a lot of stuff, and I have a very hard time convincing myself of that. And I found just through you know a little bit of personal research and just talking to other people, it it's running rampant in the tech community. I am a admin on a very large front end developer Slack like 14,000 members, and I started a mental health channel just to, hey, let's make a little bit of a safe, a, sp a safe space. If you want to rant, if you need to talk to people, we're all here, we're all in this together. And as soon as I pulled the trigger on that, it was a thousand of those people jumping in, and now that's become one of the more active channels. And one, uh, like just the uh, theme of most of the conversations are imposter syndrome. How do you deal with this? How? what do you do on interviews? I don't feel like I should be talking to these people. And it's just wonderful to see that you're not alone in this and to be able to create that outlet for other people. All right. Again, I've been talking about myself. So I've got some more questions for you. Has anybody here taken a sick day? Has anybody been afraid to call off for an injury or infection like the flu? You've been afraid to call off for those? Yeah. You broke your leg and didn't want to go in? No, I, I, I uh, was actually on, um, on the job and I just, I couldn't work. Like I felt horrible. Um, I couldn't, I could barely even stand because I just, oh. I, I felt like I had some type of um, abscess or something in my stomach. Oh. So I went into the hospital um, I got checked in and I found out that my bladder ruptured and I had urine all in my bladder. Oh. Yeah, so you didn't want to call off for that? I felt like <laughs> I, I, I felt like I would be letting the team down. And okay. I, I thought yeah. like if I told them I have to go because I feel, feel like something is wrong with me, like they wouldn't allow me or they'll oh, they'll they'll think bad of me and say, Well, yeah. You, okay, that makes sense. Or things like that. Yeah. Has anybody told somebody with glasses or contacts to just try looking harder? No? Okay. Ever told somebody in a wheelchair just get over it and walk? Ever told somebody with diabetes, high blood pressure, heart condition, stop taking your medicine? A little fresh air will do it? Well, we've got images like this. Or this, or my personal favorite, if you can't read the small text, you don't need antidepressants if you lift. But to me, they all say the same thing. It's that you're not trying hard enough, and I can vouch for the effects of medication by standing right here in front of a bunch of people I don't know. So. Uh, I'm not going to say there aren't a few side effects. I drink water like crazy, and right now my mouth is extremely dry, so excuse me. <laughs> but the, the benefits outweigh the side effects. We've got our own memes. If you can't make your own neurotransmitters, store bought is fine. <clears throat> so, what if people with physical health problems were treated the way people with mental health problems? See if we got sound. And I was we like, yeah, all right, man. It's not playing. It's not playing there? No. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Ran into this before. And I was like, Still no sound. Yeah, right, man. Oh! Oh, my head! Please don't complain. It'll ruin the vibe. Yeah, there's something. Just... Ugh. It's like you're not even trying to walk. Have you ever tried not having diarrhea? God, my migraine is killing me. You take meds for that? No! No! Why not, dude? I cut myself and it looks really, really... 
really bad! Some people have it way worse than you do. You have to chill out. <laughs> so I guess you're not going out with us tonight. Again. <laughs> Such a flake. Oh man, I really think I sprained it this time. I gotta go see my physical therapist. You got a therapy? Yeah. Whatever, weirdo. Can, can you hold on one second? Honestly, your attitude sucks. Ugh. Taking another insulin shot? Uh, yeah, I kind of have to. Have you ever thought about dropping the pharmaceuticals and fighting this the natural way? My diabetes. Enough is enough. It's a beautiful day. How do we erase the stigma? Well, for one, we need to be stronger than fear. We can start the conversation, which is what we're doing right here today. <clears throat> we can listen. If somebody trusts you enough to talk about their mental health, listen. Trust me, that, that does tremendous things. Let people know that they matter. It, and I can say as somebody with mental illness, with a disability, hearing and affirmation can do amazing things. Uh, when I was on the ambulance, I would do a lot of transfers and a lot of transportation of people with in mental health crisis. And a lot of times, uh, just talking to them, listening, all the things I'm saying would bring them down from, you know, I'm going to hurt everybody or I'm going to hurt myself and it would at least get them to a manageable uh, position to where they would talk and tell you what their problems and maybe get to the root of it so that you could give a better report off to the, the nurse without them just saying, oh, it's just another crazy coming in, put them in the lockdown room, uh, which I experienced seeing quite a bit. And looking back, it was unfortunate and I, I feel horrible for, for having that attitude towards people, but the best I can do now is be more compassionate and going forward. <clears throat> if you do have mental illness, don't be ashamed. You're not damaged, you have a disease. You shouldn't be ashamed of having a heart condition. Uh, try to be respectful. You can't always tell who has a disability, so, so try to be respectful of what you say or how you portray diseases. And if you do feel that you have mental illness, get treatment. Don't be too proud, don't be like me. Get treatment. This is all good for personal stuff, but what about in the workplace? Well, let's see what data says. Like I said, OSME did a tax survey. They're doing a tax survey every year, every couple of years. The most recent ones that I had available when I wrote this were 2016. I think the data is still being tabulated from the last one. Uh, we had approximately 1,500 responses. It was made available to several different communities, excuse me, to US residents, and all responses are self-reported. Would you bring up a potential well, health issue with a potential employer at an interview? These are separated mental, physical. Physical, about a quarter of the people said yes. With mental, only 7%. Twice as many say no, almost twice as many say no, though. You can see this 36 versus 68. <clears throat> Does your employer provide resources to learn more about mental health issues and how to seek help? Uh, and this doesn't include insurance coverage. It's pretty evenly distributed, 33, 30, 37, but only 30% can say with any certainty that they do know there are resources. Do you feel that being identified as a person with mental health issues would hurt your career? Only 12% say no, it hasn't, or no, it has not, or no, I don't think it would, or no, it has not. But the majority say yes, and yes, I think it would. Now, this is something that I worry about every time I give this talk, but it's kind of freeing knowing that I have all my cards on the table, and I've had uh, two, two potential employers who turned into employers who have seen this talk, so you know that gives me a very, very high uh, level of 
respect for them, knowing who I am, what I have, and still saying, yeah, come on board. Now, do you think that discussing a health issue with your employer would have negative consequences? We divided this up into physical and mental. Only 4% said yes for physical, 23 said yes for mental. That's over five times more people think there would definitely be negative consequences. Now remember when I said that <coughs> the, uh, the incidence of mental health issues are higher in the dev community and the tech community? You know, overall average is about 20%. Do you, have you been diagnosed with a mental health condition? 50-50, 50% of people who answered this, 1,500 responses said that they have a mental health issue. Now, as of 2015, only 17.9% had some form of mental illness. So there, there is definitely something going on in the tech community, and I think that being able to talk about it would make all of our lives a little bit easier. And all these charts lead me to one conclusion, and that is, we are afraid to talk about mental illness. And why are we afraid? The stigma. There's a stigma about mental illness and we, we as a world need to get past it. We're afraid that being honest will have negative consequences. It means suffering in silence. Uh, we're afraid coworkers might change their opinions of us. You know, worry, is somebody with anxiety worrying what other people think can drive you mad and it could cause that downward spiral where your anxiety goes up. You can't focus, you can't work, worry about what people are thinking because you're not outputting anything. Uh, and some of our minds go straight to the worst case scenario. So at a previous job, had a 90 day probationary period, anywhere in that 90 days you could say I'm out, they could say get out. On the 89th day of that, I got a message from my boss saying we need to talk. So immediately. I looked at the calendar, it's 89 days, oh crap, I need to start filling out my resume and sending them out. No, he was just checking to see how everything was going. Uh, similar scenario where <laughs> uh, I just started a job and my email had worked and then the password stopped working because they changed something so I immediately thought maybe I'm just getting Milton and they're gonna keep seeing how much work I do before telling me that I have to leave. So that's kind of a binary mind, it's either best case, worst case. <clears throat> We're also afraid that we might get sent to the HR department. Uh, I, I did tell an employer before I started doing this talk, I did tell an employer after coming up or dealing with a lot of internal struggle to go and tell somebody that I work with on a daily basis, hey, I have an issue, I need to take a little bit of time off to just reset. And as soon as I told them that, I hung up with my boss and got a call no more than five minutes later from HR saying we need to talk. Uh, how many of you know your HR department intimately, that you feel very, very, you're lucky? Oh, that I feel good and comfortable with that? Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I knew her name, but I dealt with her when I got hired, and here we were a year and a half later. Hey, so you got something to tell me, and you know, it took enough, somebody that I dealt with on a daily basis, now I have to talk to somebody that I haven't talked to in 18 months. So you might as well be dealing with a stranger. Oh, was she reasonable once you did, once you did talk? With no, <laughs> no. Uh, I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, so, but why should a workplace care? I, I, if I remember, we don't have anybody in the higher echelons of management here. But ignorance kills productivity, and by that I mean not knowing how to handle somebody with mental illness can lead to the person with mental illness not being able to do the best they can. I mean, how many lost hours just personally trying to build up that courage to go and talk to my my boss sitting at my computer thinking, okay, maybe now, maybe now, no, that, that was at least eight to 12 hours of me just dealing with it. And then the two days I needed to take to recuperate after finally going and saying, hey, I need to reset. So if I would have felt comfortable enough or if they would have known how to handle it, if I would have known that the options were available and I could just say, hey, I need a little bit of time, everything will be good. You know, there's 12 hours that didn't get lost. And reduced productivity kills the bottom line. So those were 12 hours they were paying for me that I wasn't doing anything for. And it goes both ways. I mean, I, I would have stretches where I didn't accomplish anything, 
So I was also, you know, killing the bottom line by not doing anything because I didn't want to talk, but they also didn't know how to deal with me once I did get to that point. Uh, it'd lead to job insecurity because I'd always worry about it. Management didn't know how to handle it when I went to my manager and they immediately went to HR and HR didn't want to hear about it. The exact words that were said to me were, all you had to say is you have a disability, I don't want to know what it is. So they, what, what can we do to accommodate you but don't tell us what you have. So, it, and I'm sure if I would have said well, more days off, uh, that, that might not have helped. So what we can do is fight ignorance with information. Uh, when I had my exit interview for that job, I mentioned that OSME has some handbooks. They have three handbooks for the workplace, for or for HR and workplace, for employees, and just a general guideline book. <clears throat> I'm not trying to sell anything, but they are DRM free. They're ten bucks for the set of three, and they are pretty awesome. Uh, you can find them at Bitly OSME Books. Uh, they, like I said, there are three. Hand them print out the PDFs or just send PDFs to your HR department anonymously if you want to. Uh, we're fortunate because we work in open source and we realize that the community is our greatest resource. So events like this, uh, and it, going back to that survey, 50% of respondents claimed mental illness diagnosis, half. What does that mean? Again, we're not alone. We are more than usernames. And events like this, the in-person events, really help us remember that. Granted, some people may refer to others by their usernames, but we're, we're, we're people. We're not ones and zeros. We're here actually interacting. We're, we're all going to do karaoke after this, right? <coughs> uh, so we're, we're doing boffs downstairs. We're doing you know, just this. And for those of us with mental illness, we got to remember we're not damaged. We're sick. With a little work, we can erase the stigma. And that was almost perfect timing, but okay. Uh, yeah, we can erase the stigma. I've got some resources. Like I, I've mentioned Osme quite a few times. Osmehelp.org. Check it out. If you want to become active, I will give you any information I can about them. Uh, if you're looking for a therapist, there's this nice number, 1-800-THERAPIST. I mentioned Na uh, NAMI a couple times, National Association on Mental Illness, and if you or somebody you know is in crisis, there's a suicide lifeline. All right, and I want to thank all of you for listening and being here. I really, really appreciate it. Do any of you have questions? Anything you might be able to answer? Anything you want to say? Yeah. Uh, you talked a lot about some of the symptoms that came along with some of the things you suffered from. Uh, is there anything that you did to cope that maybe you know now made it worse or made it harder to get out of a certain place that maybe somebody suffering from the same thing could watch out for? I, I, I found that I had to eventually open myself up and I, I like I said it was self-imposed isolation that I didn't really know how to get out of until I got to a point where it wasn't really coping it was and it wasn't quite you know hitting rock bottom but it was getting close to where nobody around me is feeling the same way I need to do something about this so I wish that I did have coping me mechanisms uh, I'm sure that there are resources out there and thank you for asking that because now I'm gonna look them up for the next time I do this but personally I mean a lot of people say practice mindfulness if you have the time to do that I, I know that drawing or writing down your thoughts and getting them out of your head might help and you know, even if you know, it, in programming, we have the rubber ducky technique. Grab a rubber ducky and just say what you're thinking and maybe it might tell you back, hey, there's another way to, to deal with this. So I wish that I had an answer for that, but unfortunately, I, I just got to a point where I said, oh, I need help. I think you had a question over there? Yeah, I'm just wondering how, um, ask me how they, um, they found their respondents. And is it people in the open source community, or is it so? Just a random we we put out the link to many many communities. Uh, like I said, I'm I'm a member of that pretty large Slack team, so I put out the link to them and say, hey, anybody you know, in the U.S., please 
please fill us out. It was kind of just opening it up to anybody who would listen. So I know that the results, like that 50-50, might be a little bit skewed towards people who are inclined to answer those. But still, even if you know it's it's skewed just a little bit, that's still much higher than the 20%. I would think it's actually higher than that. I'm sure there are people who are not diagnosed. Yeah, yeah. Whether they <coughs> realize it or not. Yeah. And a lot of us are too proud to admit it. I, I'm the first one to say I was too proud. And Do you have a link to that slide, Jim? Uh, I can get you one. I don't know it off the top of my head. It's a front-end developer Slack, and it's worldwide, and we're trying to or get rid of some of the... Because it's worldwide and it's open to everybody, we, we have 15,000 members, and it... I, I did a check, only about 2,000 of them are active, and we need to just clear it out. So the number looks good until you look behind the scenes. Anybody else? I, I just want to thank you for, for yeah. doing the presentation. I, I am interested in this topic because my brother has bipolar disorder, and when he was first you know, experienced these symptoms and, and coming to terms with realizing he had it, he went through denial. And, mm -hmm. and I think the stigma create helps. It may not be the only thing that creates the denial, but it's certainly one of the right. things. And, 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 and yeah, I remember when he was dealing with it, I actually went and lived with him for a while to try and help him with some coping issues he was having. And we turned on the news one night, and they had a story about this. This was in New York. The police had been called to a situation where some guy with, with mental illness had, had gotten out of control a little bit and was mm -hmm. throwing rocks and they came and shot him to death. And, yeah. And I, and I remember, if, maybe if I hadn't been with my brother at that moment, it wouldn't have hit me but as much as it did. But, you know, that's, this guy, everyone, his neighbors didn't want him shot. They wanted Right, right. But that's, that's you know, and that, that's probably what, or an example of what your worst fear is if you're, if you're open about it. Definitely. And, and I remember thinking of, you know, situations slightly different. That could have been my brother that they that they, they, they shot. And it's, yeah. It's and but through op opening up about it and, and getting he's, he's doing great. He's good. You know, I, I'm you know I, I I've been, he's a musician and I've been in situations where you know people come up to me and it's it's like he's he's, he's my famous brother. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> So great to see how well he's doing because he was able to, to, to oh, but he's also still to this day experiencing the thing that you're talking about about not wanting to tell people about right. it because he's afraid of how it might affect his career and all exactly. that. Exactly. So which is a shame because he wants to be open about it and off of the years, but it's, he, he feels like he has to choose his battles. Definitely. I, I can definitely sympathize with that. Yeah. And I'm sort of on the, not I'm the executive side, but I'm a worker owner in a small worker owned cooperative. So I'm trying to look at this also from the what kind of policies can we put in place and that kind of thing. And so I'm sort of curious on your thoughts of, like, I mean, mental wellness is for everyone, not just people who oh, definitely. have you know, mental illness. So I'm just wondering, like, what you think about that more broader, inclusive approach, or like, like, how much of that is good, and to what extent do you have to be like, you know, we're really going to have dedicated resources to I think that part, at least for me, part of the stigma, you know, there, there's a joke of I need to take mental health days. It's not really a joke, but, you know, everybody does need them. I agree. But, uh, you know, there, there are people who legitimately have mental illness, and of course, and I hate to say it, but there are people who will say, well, I need mental health days just because they want to go shopping or they want to go see a movie or something like that. So I, I think that having the policy available is for everybody. You don't have to, you know, bring your I have depression card to, to take part in it, but also the people who take advantage of it do ruin it for those of us who have the mental illness and do need the time off. and because it's not an outwardly apparent uh, disability, it's hard for HR professionals or anybody in companies to say, well, I don't believe you, can you come in with a doctor's note? Or because I, 
And the, the OSME handbooks do cover a lot of the ADA uh, guidelines. And I, I couldn't say off the top of my head if, well, from what the HR professional who told me, you don't have to tell me your disability, all you have to do is say, I have a disability. And you know, so they might have different I don't think there's a burden of proof on the person claiming a disability. I don't know if I just created more questions or answered your question. <laughs> so I struggle with mental illness and it is a very real thing that affects the way that you work. And so I guess I, I, I don't have a good answer just to respond to kind of both sides of the point. Um, I think it's really great to have an inclusive mindset, um, particularly because, like Janie mentioned, a lot of people don't know that they suffer from this or they haven't fully realized it. So I think that it can be really important to avoid getting in that downward spiral by, by having resources or in some way addressing needs before it becomes a problem because at the end of the day, mental illness is defined by how it affects your day-to-day -day life and how much. Um, on the other hand, I would say that whatever you do, and I'm sure you know this, but I think it just bears repeating, I would just be really mindful and careful about not trivializing for the people that, that know that they suffer from it. Um, like I said, I don't have any concrete suggestions, <laughs> but I think that's my perspective as maybe someone who this would affect or I think someone that works. I think that's a really good question. Anyone else? Actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, it was really great to hear you talk about the downward spiral um, of the paranoia that you're not getting things done, feeding into not getting things done feeding into the paranoia of not getting things yeah. done. Um, the way that you articulated it was really spot on, and it's something that I think, at least for me, I have suffered from, and um, it's really hard to explain it, but it happens so often. You know, mm -hmm. for the other devs in the room, like, it's it's when a project manager comes up and, and asks you about, you know, the status of ticket XYZ, and... And that makes it all good. <laughs> Um, and or so to give a better example, I was on a project a couple of years ago, um, and it was like headed for failure. Like the timeline was way too short. It was it was kind of doomed from the outset. Um, but the other developer I was working with and I figured out how we were going to get it done, and we came up with our own plan. And the response from our management, unfortunately, was to keep keep like yelling at us about getting like doing the plan that we were doing if that makes sense so it's kind of it would be like if you're in a van and I was like hey like play better yeah now. <laughs> yeah right and, and have you tried not sucking <laughs> and it just and it just got to this point where that, that pressure from them was crippling we couldn't do anything like it was psychological yeah. And it, I, it blew my mind that we could not get them to understand that it all they had to do was just back off. Right. And so I guess I just, like, given your experience, like, do you know, are there any ways to, like, stop that cycle once it starts happening? Or, like, how do you... The best thing for me was when I did take just a couple days off to recuperate, and it might not even be that much time. It might be, you know, get out of the office, walk around the block a couple times to clear your head. Uh, but my, my problem for me was that I let it get to that point where I couldn't function and I needed those two, three days to get to a point where I could function again. But even then, the entire time, I'm you know, fighting myself not to open up my laptop and just say, you know what, I'm just gonna keep trucking through this. But yeah, I, I wish that I had better answers than that, but uh, one thing that I could recommend for, for project managers or anybody in management is mental health first aid. It's a class that they, I'm sure they have around here every couple months. Uh, I, I should know how often, and I should know where, but I don't. It is a great class, though, that will help for anybody, not just management, to recognize and better deal with 
mental health issues instead of, like you said, well, have you tried working harder? Have you tried working harder? Just keep going. Why aren't you done yet? Because that, that, that isn't effective. I know for me, um, meditating helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah, like that, the mindfulness. Yeah. Because I, I, I don't understand. It's like, but I, I'm mindful. So I get to a point where I'm just like, get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> right. Which doesn't work well in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a, maybe this is about some, I'm assuming that people in this room, all, I mean, you, know, you may have a mental illness, but you're still able to function most of the time. Yeah. And there are people who have, for example, like paranoid schizophrenia. Yeah, definitely. They, they really need to be institutionalized. Or, yeah. they can't, or even if they're not institutionalized, they can't really hold a, a, a job in this, I mean, or a yeah. full-time basis. And I, I, do you have any thoughts about them within the tech community or that sort of person? Or? I think that the tech community is extremely inclusive mm -hmm. and there is a spot for everybody in it. And if we can, you know, mentorship or, and you know, I, I don't like really talking about my paramedic history because I, I feel like as I talked about, I'm saying, well, I was a paramedic and haha, no, I, I did experience some stuff on there. And like I said, for both sides and some of the institutions, some of them are awesome. I'm not going to say that they aren't, but some of the institutions, like you say, institutionalized, are absolutely just horrendous and there's no opportunity for people who get put in there. So I think that, you know, and this is a much larger problem that mental health needs to be taken seriously on a global scale instead of just necessarily in the tech community. But if, if there were resources available, like re outreach or uh, last year at MidCamp, we did a specific training for free for people with disabilities to come in. And I, I think we made it available to any disability. And somebody, one of the professors here at DePaul who teaches content management systems put it on. And it was extremely well received. So I think that you know this, this, it's a much larger problem than we can solve in the the eight minutes we have left. But definitely, I think there is spot a spot for everybody in the tech community. It's just getting the resources available to show them that the spots are open. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. I know I run out of time, but. Uh, Either from personal experience or just any information you've read, if you if you maybe see somebody that's suffering from the same thing, you've already accepted what you had, maybe you have a treatment for it. Do you have any suggestions on how to say like, maybe start the conversation if they're in denial about maybe having a mental illness or to get them help or help them out? The best I would say is I know it's kind of a touchy way. It is very you touchy. Have mental illness, I can see it, but is there any way you can maybe help somebody? I think that people like to be around people like themselves, so that if, and they, they tend to open up if you start talking about yourself. So if, if like me, uh, just random survey, how many people have, who in this room right now, have just opened up about mental illness, talked about mental illness prior to this event, to this? Okay, so I saw some hands that didn't go up, but you know, now that I'm opening the conversation, other people are now talking more about it, just in this room. Which I think is great. So maybe talking about your own, I'm not saying your own, but you know, for, for somebody who is observing that and another person may be saying, well, I've been going through this and it might spark them to say, you know what, I've been having kind of the same thing happening. Now that you mention it, what can I do? What helped you? Well, I was thinking along those lines, one thing you can do is talk to them and try to help the conversation go along the lines to help them understand or see what they're doing. Because um, you're not going to convince somebody that uh, of anything. They have to come to that themselves. Yeah. You can help them see where they're at or what they're doing. That's because you, you can't change anybody. That's a, a universal law. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what you can do is you can help them become aware mm -hmm. and yeah. go go to a, a look at it from that perspective. And if I can just interject, I have a really good friend who does suffer from um, mental illness, uh, depression, and she's been in and I don't, sometimes I don't know what the right thing to say is. I am sometimes afraid that I might say the wrong thing, but I try to be supportive. Right. 
has been going to a therapist, and there are things that just aren't working, you know, changing different medications, and that just makes things worse, and it takes a while for medications to kick in. Yeah, oh, that wrong. first the two weeks to a month was... Yeah, and it's not instantaneous, but there's all kinds of things that he's doing, and I, I try to be as supportive as I can, but it's difficult. Yeah. It really is difficult. But he knows that I'm there for him. And if he ever needs anything, I will do what I can. And that's all you can do. Just try to do your best, but just be cognizant of mm -hmm. don't make it worse. <laughs> that's why don't, don't, be good now. don't exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Like, I keep, I keep like, um, it's, I've both experienced this and also like, I'm really close with someone where I've been going this with them and um, you have to have a really really light touch um, you have to be really mindful of what you're what you're suggesting I, I always try to be careful to say um, for me when I experience or when I feel XYZ then doing you know this helps or something like that and like you were saying you have to they have to realize it for themselves but you might be able to plant that seed um, but but it's very easy to push someone over the line where they then become resistant to the idea because they, I think what I'm trying to get at is it depends where they are in their mental health journey. Like if mm -hmm. it's someone who's, who's going to therapy, you know, who knows themselves in that way maybe a bit more than someone who doesn't, um, you can just straight up ask them how you can help them. You can say like, what can I do to help you? Like, tell me how I can help you. That might be like, leave me alone, or it might be like, I need you to do my dishes because I haven't been able to do them, and it's horrible, you know, stuff like that. But um, I don't know, it's definitely really, really tough. Um, and I think that's, I, I had the same question, actually. It's kind of on the continuum, but I mean, I have another brother who always had a hard time getting along with people for years and years and we all felt that we needed some kind of help but I don't know if I can I, I don't know if we classify that as even a mental illness it's just everyone really needed some kind of help and but you, we also know it would be dangerous to bring it up with him because it would offend him and so we just kind of all kind of and eventually he kind of figured it out a little bit and it's gotten better but he, he, we couldn't push it on him in some cases, I think it can be helpful to help someone understand the impact that their mental illness has on people they care about. Now, my one concern about that would be if a person was suicidal at all, they might decide that they'd be doing a lot of favor by not being there. Um, but I, um, for me, and um, because I'm older than a lot of people, out or do it yourself doesn't work. I tried that approach for 45 years, um, and when I finally went to a psychiatrist, she said, so how's that working for you? really, which is why I'm here. Um, but, the, but the one thing, the one thing that got me through all those years was not wanting to hurt my children. So I had uh, pretty bad problems with postpartum depression, but always it was geared towards, I don't want to hurt this child, so I'd better go away or, you know, or something like that. Um, and then um, right towards the end of, of the time of my you know, invincibility, um, I, uh, my daughter was, uh, was a young adult by then, but I said things in front of her that really scared her, and I thought, I just, I did that to her. How, how could I have done that to her? And it's one of the things that finally made me realize that, that I needed help. Um, so, but like I said, you know, there were certainly, and in fact, the, one of the things I did say in front of her was that, was basically everyone would be better off if I were dead. You know, I'm like, what do you do when your mother says that to you? It's like, that's a kind of a freak out thing. So, um, but I wasn't that close to suicide, you know what I mean? It was like, it was something I would think about. I actually had a method planned out, you know, but I wasn't truly, like, at that point of, oh, I'm going to kill myself. But, um, but, it, but seriously, what got me through those 45 years was 
I don't want to hurt my husband. I don't want to hurt my children. Um, you know, my, my brothers and sisters and stuff like that. So um, if somebody during that time had said to me, what you're doing is hurting your children. You just need some help. It might have helped. I, you know, I don't know. You, I guess you kind of have to figure out what drives that person, like what's most important to them. You know, if you know them well enough to figure that out, you might be able to use that. I'm really happy that you said that because when you first started saying it, my initial reaction was like, oh my gosh, if someone told me that I was like, that I was hurting them, that would exacerbate everything because that's my greatest fear. Um, but I think what you're saying is true, and now that you've mentioned it, I've seen that work. And yes. sometimes that's, it, it causes, I think it's, it shifts the, the mindset of it, or it just, it, it changes the perspective of just enough maybe for someone to be able to look outside themselves for a second. Yeah, you do just have to be really careful though because people sometimes truly believe that the world will be a better place if they're not in it. And so you just can't go there. But um, but I, I don't know, I mean, for the most part. Uh, and you know what's funny, my son, um, I know we're over the time, I'm sorry. My son was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and, um, and ADD when he was about 20 years old. And uh, he had to leave college because of this. We'd known for quite some time that he was ill, but he, I won't go to a therapist. I'm not crazy. Only crazy people need mental health help, you know. Um, but then he Guilty. finally did it. In essence, he made it his full-time job for about nine months to, to get better. He ended up on a couple of different medications, um, which, you know, thankfully worked out well for him. Um, he was able to go back to school, and, um, and he's, a, uh, he's a developer in essence, he works at Amazon. Um, but he was a kid who we thought might never get out of the basement, you know, and then he moves to Seattle and gets this great job, so that's like, that's a huge success story. But so all along, oh, I'm the supportive mom, you know, yes, honey, you know, and, and we all really did learn a lot from his, from his experience, like reading his psychological profile and stuff, we're like, wow, you know, we understand so much better what's been going on with him. It was a really great family experience. Even his younger sister ended up understanding why there were times when they really could barely live in the same house, you know. Um, but so I hear I'm this great mom. Oh yes, honey, it's just an illness, you know. You shouldn't be ashamed of it. And, and this whole time, I'm knowing that I am ill too. But somehow I'm an exception. For me, it's shameful. For nobody else is it shameful, just for me. And my therapist once said, so what makes you so special? <laughs> <laughs> you know, or like, if you're so horrible, why has your husband mar been married to you for 35 years? I ask myself that same question every day. I can't imagine. So, <laughs> Not Jewish, is, are you? Uh, Not Jewish, are you? Might as well be. <laughs> Um, All right, we are over time, and I see people standing at the door getting ready to come in. So, thank you all for coming.